Thank you very much and thank you for coming out on such a dreary day to hear me. Um, so my paper today is a prolegomenon to a chapter which I've been commissioned to write for the new Cambridge Constitutional History of the United Kingdom. The Cambridge Constitutional History of the United Kingdom has been conceived by the editors as filling a need for a big picture history of the kind that's, been, that's fallen out of fashion in the wake of more granular, highly contextual, anthropological and geographical approaches to history and legal history with its modern focus on bottom-up and pluralistic approaches to assessing how law has actually been experienced in the world. And perhaps a concession to the modern, the editors of the Cambridge History have gently suggested that we avoid being too Whiggish, but otherwise have given us very little by way of methodological steer and no time constraints. So no, there's no periodization here. So all of it, if you can. Um, so my, um, this is a, an apology for why I haven't finished it yet. Um, <laughs> My reasons for taking so long and finishing my contribution have to do with fundamental issues about what we're doing when we're doing constitutional history. Robert Gordon has described the relationship between lawyers and historians as one of intimate antagonism. Law derives its authority from history and lawyers tend to use and abuse historical accounts to conserve, stabilize and legitimate the status quo or perhaps to encourage some incremental reforms. And that's especially true of constitutional history. Stabilization, showing continuity. Why otherwise would the Magna Carta still be the subject of so much loyally reverence, or that deliberative, administrative and judicial body of long standing, the Star Chamber, have come to represent all that was wrong with the rule of the Stuart Kings? Historicism, by contrast, is engaged in rescuing the past from the distortions of the present-minded and emphasising the embeddedness of legal forms in the peculiarities of context. The modernist, anti-foundational philosophy of history treats meaning as entirely consequential on circumstance. So there's no big history there. How then is one to write a constitutional history which historians as well as constitutional lawyers would respect. And my task is made more complex because the topic I've been given is the executive and administration. Now, of course, it's possible to make the obligatory genuflection to a provision of the Magna Carta 1215, where King John promises to appoint as justices, constables, sheriffs, or other officials only men that know the law of the realm and are minded to keep it well. And of course, there are numerous references to kings succumbing to the advice of evil counsellors. But for the most part, while constitutional lawyers have long been obsessed with kings and queens and the scope of their prerogative powers, they have on the whole pretty much ignored actual administration. The organisation of the executive administration has been largely missing from or has been given scant treatment over time in the iconic constitutional texts uh, of which, to which we still refer. If administration appears at all, it often appears in the crevices, peripheries or silences of such narratives. And as for the history of the legal controls on the administration, administrative law, while some contemporary scholars claim to be able to trace the golden thread of the prerogative writs back centuries, most regard administrative law, properly so called, as having been invented in the 1960s. Doctrinal treatments anyway tend to ignore or marginalise institutional arrangements and social and political arrangements too. Notably, Martin Lachlan has devoted himself to explaining uh, uh, Maitland, why the history of administrative law in particular has never been written. So constitutional law, law sources don't look to provide that much by way of helpful material. So you see why I'm, I'm worried about this chapter. 
Now, the work of historians, on the other hand, on the history of administration and institutions, by contrast, appears to be a lot more fruitful. There's a wealth of institutional histories and histories which may incidentally tell us something about administration. There are interesting biographical accounts of particular office holders and the patronage systems which attach to them. There are histories of particular periods or subjects, the Navy, the Church, which incidentally tell a story of administration in a highly contextual way. But that presents me with a new difficulty. If constitutional lawyers have said too little about administration, administrative histories are too granular to establish a coherent long-term narrative and commonly describe administration in terms of, and these are sorts of phrases that come up, a complex mosaic, a patchwork, uh, the new and grafted onto the old. And there's an additional problem, of course. What of any of this history could one properly describe as constitutional? So there's a major challenge then to establish what it is that transforms history into constitutional history. The LSE constitutional lawyer, John Griffith, argued that everything that happens in politics is constitutional, and if nothing happened, that too would be constitutional. Now, that's a, an important antidote to the romanticization and insularity to which British constitutional history has traditionally been prone, uh, but frankly, it's not very helpful to me uh, for present purposes. So if extreme contextualists, either of a Skinnerian or Griffith bent, are right, then constitutional history of a long-term kind is just not possible. In order to become possible, constitutional history has, I think, to be regarded as a special kind of history of ideas. Following, following Frege, it must be possible to follow a set of concepts through their various contextual instantiations. There are questions in constitutional law which, while they may not have equal significance in all periods, may be pervasive nevertheless. Some concepts may remain dormant for a time, or as I hope to show, uh, can become hollowed out of their earlier meanings. But there's something necessarily normative in rendering the materiality of history into legal categories for the purposes of telling a constitutional history. And it's inevitably a selective rendering. So how am I going to go about writing a history of the executive and administration when it's been marginalized by constitutional lawyers and the administrative histories are too granular for my purposes? What should be my constitutional anchor for this project? Well, I propose to start with a concept, and that concept is one of office. I don't suppose that the concept of office has been unchangeable or has even enjoyed equal importance across time. But I do presume until evidence can be shown to the contrary that certain of the questions raised by office will remain pervasive over time, even as the legal forms which those questions take and the answers to those questions change. So I'm going to start not with the Magna Carta, but much more controversially with the 16th century French political theorist, Jean Baudin. Baudin takes an explicitly comparative approach to different political and governmental arrangements across Europe, and he uses a common reference point. That is Rome, the fall of Rome to diagnose constitutional causes and effects. No doubt, as Ben Straumann has identified, he sometimes gets points of Roman history wrong and hence sometimes misdiagnoses causes. Nevertheless, the six books of the Republic are a self-conscious attempt retrospectively to constitutionalise and theorise historical and comparative examples. My main reason to start with Baudin, though, is that he self-describes his contribution as being the first political thinker to define the concept of office. And doing so 
not only delineates a concept which we might still recognise today, and the references to Chris Tomlin's there, but also identifies some of the pervasive questions one might ask about an official. Bodan's work was widely read in Britain in the 17th century, including by James VI of Scotland and by Chief Justice Cook. It also came to British attention via Bodan's influence on Montesquieu. So I want to spend a few minutes uh, referring to what Bodan said in order to frame this inquiry, anchoring this inquiry in something that we can recognise as constitutional. What does Bodan say? Well, Bodan makes a crucial distinction between the state and government. A state may be a hereditary monarchy and the government aristocratic. A state may be popular, the government may be aristocratic. The state may be a monarchy and the government popular. But his point is that leaving government out of the narrative of the state as if it were a relatively minor detail is not only incomplete, but it is seriously misleading about the constitutional nature of the whole. Unfortunately, this is a point he makes, uh, but in the uh, more recent editions, uh, the books get split so you don't see the whole of his work, so this is a problem for us. Um, Bodan carefully distinguishes between the right of sovereignty and its exercise. He differentiates between the state of the Commonwealth and the administration and government of the same. And in so doing, he gives administration a central place in the constitutional framework, something that's missing from a lot of modern treatments, actually. And according to Bodan, an official being neither sovereign nor subject occupies a crucial interstitial space between the citizen and the state. Officers resembled the sovereign because they, like the sovereign, could exercise public powers. And yet, in other respects, officers shared the subordinate position of subject and occupied positions carved out by law and must remain, in theory, the inferiors of sovereign authority. So this places office in a very interesting and important place. Officers share characteristics of the sovereign, but also of the citizen. That's a really powerful idea in constitutional law terms. And such a definition, I think, identifies a broad concept that we can recognise over time. It also helps us to locate what is constitutional about administration. Officials are defined and limited by law. And this, of course, also imposes a crucial side constraint on a sovereign, even Bodan's sovereign claiming to be above the law. Bodan's framework then helps us to identify some pervasive questions. One of his crucial concerns is that if sovereigns rule directly, if sovereigns don't mediate their rule by officials, who are defined by law, then that leads to tyranny. So one of the questions that I think arises out of that uh, framing of, of the issues is how should institutional arrangements guard against the dangers associated with direct rule? So that's one of my questions that I'm going to come back to. How should institutional arrangements guard against the dangers associated with direct rule? rule. Another question Bodan identifies is, given that officials are necessarily and expressly established by law, by what law are they governed? Now that must seem like an obvious question, but actually it's an extremely helpful one for an historian of administration. Um, when I've workshopped some of this material in the past, one of the criticisms has been that people want to know more about the prerogative writs before their revival in the 1960s, and they think this is the real administrative law. That's the real administrative law as they see it. But Bodan requires us, I think, to ask a more capacious set of questions about the legal forms and processes through which officials have been appointed over time, matters of tenure and processes for removal, the varieties of jurisdiction, delegation or mandate conferred on them, 
and how, and only then, how they're able, uh, held, to be, uh, held to account both by the sovereign in a political relation and also by the law. This also suggests the potential for the independence of officers from their political superiors to vary across time and across different office holders. Um, Baudin would actually go further and contend that officers have a duty to remonstrate with a sovereign in certain circumstances and to disobey a sovereign if a sovereign's commands are contrary to the laws of God and nature or nature. So as I say, very serious side constraints on absolutist sovereignty here. And then the third set of questions, finally, is that Baudin identifies another uh, important issue that is almost certainly long dogged office, and that's of how the tension between the desire of an office holder for private enrichment and advancement and the obligations on an office holder to serve the public good are managed by law and institutions. Baudin, of course, puts it in the terms of his day. Office, he says, should not be treated as if it were private property or a source of personal enrichment, either in the hands of the sovereign or in the hands of the office holder. Uh, this was at a time when offices were routinely brought and sold throughout Europe. Office, says Baudin, is not the proper subject of private patrimony, but rather one of guardianship. An office continues after the person appointed to it has left it. Offices belong to the Commonwealth and are a thing put in trust. So Baudin likens the relationship between sovereign and office holder to a commercial transaction between a legal owner and a borrower rather than that of a master and slave. Uh, that's going to be important for when we come back to that. So my proposed method then is to take Baudin as a starting point, not for his historical accounts of political organisation, but for how he frames the constitutional role of administration, delineates office, and for the questions he asks in the 16th century in respect of office. We need these questions to help us organise an inquiry not only to, into how things were, but into how people conceived of how things were in a constitutional sense. So I'm going to now test uh, this methodology by use of two examples uh, from different periods. Um, uh, so I'm going to start, I'm very nervous about mentioning Blackstone with so many people here who know about Blackstone, but I'm going to start um, with this first issue which Baudin is, is concerned about, which is the problems of direct rule, the dangers of direct rule that can lead to tyranny, and how he thinks the dangers of direct rule um, may be countered by appropriate institutional arrangements. Now, one of Baudin's contended solutions to the problem of direct rule is that there, he says there was, and I quote, never a council in any well-ordered commonwealth with a power to command. It should advise and not execute policies. In other words, lawmakers should not enforce law. The institution, uh, this um, intuition, sorry, is one that we still recognise today, um, often clothed in separation of powers language, and that would be anachronistic, and I, I don't want to go there because I think his... Uh, Baudin's interest is a much more basic one, the problem of direct rule, a more fundamental uh, idea. Now, at the time that Baudin was writing, of course, executive power meant either the function of administering justice under the law or the machinery of justice under the law, uh, how the machinery of justice under the law was put into effect. Up until the end of the 17th century, the term executive was used almost exclusively to describe judicial functions, literally to refer to executing the laws, putting the laws into effect at the behest of the king. The executive then necessarily included the judges. And this made sense at a time when the most significant impact of government upon its subjects was through the courts or law enforcement offices. 
The idea of an executive function separate from the judicial function then only emerged sometime in the 17th century and did not fully develop until the end of the 18th century. Vile suggests that the emergence of an independent judiciary out of the political struggles of the 17th century complicated constitutional thinking by apparently constituting a separate branch of government and upsetting the theory of the mixed constitution. Blackstone's 18th century treatment of these matters, uh, which was much criticised by Bentham and later Dicey, struggles to say something coherent about these developments, about the separation of judiciary from everything else, but this intuition that ex executive power is about putting the laws into effect. Blackstone's commentaries set out the then traditional understandings of mixed government. There are functionally distinct powers which can only be used coercively if the different parts act in concert. Blackstone argues that the executive power should be a branch, though not the whole of the legislature, because a total union of them would be productive of tyranny, a total disjunction of them would produce the same result given that the legislature would gradually assume to itself the rights of, sovereign, of, of executive power. The king, he says, has the power of veto only, a power of rejection rather than proposal, not the power of doing wrong then, but only of preventing wrong from being done. On the other hand, the king's consent is required to legislation that would abridge his executive power. So, so far, all is in balance in uh, Blackstone's scheme. Elsewhere, Blackstone introduces Roman law ideas about magistracy. There are two supreme magistrates, he says, the legislative branch consisting of the king, lords and commons, in whom the supreme and absolute authority of the state is vested by our constitution, and the executive consisting of the king alone, in whom the sovereign power of the state resides, and who is, and I quote, the sole executive magistrate. Blackstone treats separately those who are members of the monarch's council, likened to the Roman Senate, who enjoy powers of dignity and counsel, but not of authority, and who cannot give effect to their own advice. Contrasted with magistrates or commissioners who issue and or execute orders. It's important that these be separate then, Blackstone emphasises, because if the making and the execution of the laws were vested in one man, or the same body of men, there can be no public liberty. So this idea is strongly re reminiscent of Baudin's separate treatment of concilium, making the laws, advising the king, uh, and imperium, executing the laws. There are numerous problems with this proposition, though, in terms of accurately describing the constitutional arrangements as they actually operated at the time. So his theory does not fully reflect the materiality of history, uh, but I am going to cast it as a theory, uh, and I think that helps explain what he's doing. Blackstone ignores the cabinet, the emerging role of the prime minister, the fact that the king's senior ministers are also members of the commons. Bentham and Dicey criticised him for vesting far too much power in the monarch, and uh, they were right to do so. But I think it's important to understand the cause of these distortions. He's trying, perhaps against the facts, to maintain a normative distinction between the making and the execution of the laws. And he goes to quite some lengths to do this. I think this concern is further revealed in Blackstone's discussion of those subordinate magistrates who are involved in executing the laws. So he's modern in that he discusses the judges separately, but Blackstone then deliberately and self-consciously omits to discuss the powers and duties of the great officers of state, such as the Lord Treasurer, the Lord Chamberlain, and the principal secretaries of state. He gives us his reason that, and I quote, I do not know that they are in that capacity in any considerable degree the objects of our laws, or have any very important share of magistracy conferred upon them except that secretaries of state 
are allowed the power of commitment in order to bring offenders to trial. Notably, this was just before the iconic and groundbreaking case of Enterkin Carrington confirmed that the Secretary of State's executive powers were not as extensive as the Secretary of State claimed. And this was also before statute began to confer broad powers on Secretaries of State. So Blackstone, in a short separate um, chapter, confines himself instead to discussing a somewhat perplexing list of those who execute the laws, which includes sheriffs, uh, coroners, justices of the peace, constables, surveyors of highways, and the overseers of the poor. Even at the time, the role of the highest of these ancient officers, the sheriff, had become increasingly ceremonial, at least in England, not so here in Scotland. But Blackstone's focus is on these officials concerned in matters affecting the liberty of the people. So in other words, in order to maintain the distinction between making and executing laws required by his constitutional theory, Blackstone leaves out some of the most important parts of the government apparatus. Facts that are important to his theory are foregrounded and those which are inconvenient are left out in the cause of preserving the idea of a mixed constitution and in order to separate the making of laws from their execution. And in doing so, he leaves out much of the administration, including that of local government. So this is Blackstone attempting a foundational theoretical constitutional story, and it also helps explain why uh, the administration's been marginalised a, a lot in thinking in Britain and in the United States, I think. Um, so that's Blackstone's story um, that, that distorts things and leaves things out. Um, so that's one way you could tell the constitutional history. But there's also another, much more disruptive, anti-foundationalist story to be told. Uh, the struggles for judicial independence are well known. Um, less well known, though, are the struggles to establish the independence of office hold holders in the Commons from the King. So this is a different narrative now that I'm, I could tell about the same uh, story. Uh, there was already an issue in 1625 as office holders found that they were required to support policies of the king that they felt bound to criticise in the Commons. During the long parliament and the rump, there was much political energy expended on the issue of appointment, tenure and payment of offices. By the time of the Restoration, there was an increasing concern in certain quarters to exclude from the Commons the King's ministers, placemen, and other members of the Commons holding office of the Crown. Now, these problems were intended to be resolved in the Act of Settlement. But here we have an example of locating constitutional law and what did not happen. This is quintessentially anti-foundationalist um, history. So according to its original terms to take effect when the Hanoverians came to the throne, no person who held an office or place of profit under the crown was able to serve as a member of the commons. Had that come into effect, that would have effectively forestalled the development of the Westminster system in which the executive is located inside parliament. But as Maitland tells us, um, before the provision came into effect, it was amended to disqualify from the House of Commons only those persons holding an office or a place of profit created after 25th of October 1705. So we owe the present position uh, to this obscure and apparently arbitrary provision. Holders of high office tending to be older officers can sit in the Commons, while holders of subordinate offices are generally uh, disqualified from sitting. The distinction between high political and subordinate administrative officers, the pu public service, was not a principled but a thin and an arbitrary one. The carving out of ministerial offices from other office holders was the work of political compromise. Roman law didn't help here, right? so th this, was a, this was a problem. So this is all compromise. Another clause proposed in the Act of Settlement would have imposed an obligation on the king's councillors individually to give advice under his hand so that his responsibility for the advice might be brought home to him. Now, this clause was an attempt to modernise the system for the verification of authority and advice 
which had long been served by the use of the king's seals and about which there was a lot of law. The clause itself uh, did not survive. Uh, the complex laws relating to the seal, uh, seals also fell into disuse, but the practice of the advisor countersigning after the king has survived, even to the present day. And here the materiality of practice served as the foundation of the modern doctrine of ministerial responsibility. Gradually, the political practice of attempting to exclude ministers from the commons was reversed so that the commons could become an institution which could oversee the work of ministers. These practices also, I think, have historical antecedents and earlier exercises of the impeachment power in the commons, which were used to draw attention to officials' bad administration and poor judgment. Um, the House of Lords didn't see it that way, but it was used in the House of Commons in that way. So here, I think, is an example where practices and forms have survived. So reflecting back on this story, this uh, first story, what happened, and even those things that nearly but did not quite happen, are part of the materiality of history. These facts are material to the Constitution, and, they help, and that they help to address questions of pervasive constitutional moment, such as the one Bodan identified, how should institutional arrangements guard against the dangers associated with direct rule? But attempts to theorise and give normative coherence to the Constitution are as interesting and important as what actually happened when you're telling the constitutional history. And this is true even if those attempts do not fully reflect the materiality of history. And that's because such theories are not epiphenomenal. They do have an effect on the world into the future. The idea that advisory and implementation functions should be kept distinct is still with us. One of its modern manifestations being in the reluctance of the police to advise on the content of the criminal law. More significantly, these ideas informed the founding of the American Republic. Should they nonetheless still count as constitutional history of the United Kingdom? Well, I don't think ideas have borders like that. So now let me turn to my second example of the use of this methodology in addressing how the 19th century introduction of a unified civil service significantly affected both the independence of and the legal accountabilities attaching to officials. So we're moving um, further now. And here I would like to argue that much of the law of the official was lost or changed between the 18th and the late 19th centuries. While the term official remains constantly in use, the concept and its meaning is transformed or even hollowed out. The questions which Bodan identified about the constitutional role of the official survive, but institutional changes transform how these issues manifest themselves and their political salience also varies over time. So during the 17th century, Many of the concerns about the independence of public officers from the sovereign were manifested in questions of tenure. There was an elaborate system of law that determined the appointment process, the term and the tenure of individual officers or types of office. And I think profound changes in thinking occurred during this time, which also had consequences for how independent office holders could be from their political superiors. It's commonplace, of course, to suggest that all public officers were in the grant of the king. But processes for appointment varied according to the office and its importance. So, for example, the appointment of sheriffs in the 15th century were made by the monarch, but in conjunction with the judges and the senior officials in quite an elaborate process. Terms of office were customary and varied dramatically. So the office of sheriff and constable was uh, granted only for a year. Um, during the first half of the 17th century, by contrast, 
Most middle-ranking offices in the courts, departments and regions were held for life, and the use of reversions could effectively make such offices hereditary in certain families. There was then a system of bureaucratic subimputation which limited the Crown's future freedom of appointment and effectively created a queue of people to whom the office would pass. Uh, no doubt this led to stability, and there were also few purges, um, but it also limited the monarch's ability to reward and control grantees as James VI of Scotland and Charles I found to their frustration. Tenure also varied as between fixed term offices, offices held at pleasure, offices for life and offices held on good behaviour. And we can detect a big normative shift in expectations about which degree of independence should be enjoyed by various offices and how this should be reflected in terms of tenure in the 17th century. It had earlier been assumed, for example, that judges should be easily removable to make them specially answerable for their role. And I know there's a lot of judges here. Right? So, so the, the intuition um, leading up to the 17th century that was to recognise the special role of judges, but that led to uh, the idea that they should be easily removable. Um, in contrast, ministerial officers, being the Crown's executive agents, should be less responsible for what they did and were thought sometimes properly to hold their office for life. Uh, a reversal of modern expectations. Um, by 1640, uh, we have evidence that these ideas were clearly being challenged. A judge ruled invalid a grant of the marshalship of the King's Bench for a fixed term on the basis that this was an office of great trust and should therefore attract greater security of tenure. Now, the details of this don't matter for present purposes, I know that tenure is not the most riveting thing, but my point is um, that well into the 19th century, issues about official responsiveness, control, independence, tended to be translated into ex ante controls on tenure. Patronage played a large part in appointments, and the introduction of merit appointments to the salaried civil service in the mid-19th century took a very long time to change this. By the middle of the 20th century, though, these issues were no longer salient. We don't tend to see them. Tenure concerns had been translated into the special employment rules pertaining to the civil service, which guaranteed permanence, notwithstanding changes in the political branch of government, were oriented to maintaining political neutrality uh, contained uniform pay steps and procedures for promotion to stop favouritism. Um, uh, and independence now was also to be maintained uh, not by law, not by laws of tenure, but by the Constitutional Convention protecting free and frank advice to ministers. Employment in the civil service uh, was still treated as a distinct branch of law, but was becoming more like other forms of employment, um, sometimes supplemented by ethical codes and so on. But tensions, the tensions about responsiveness and independence, never really went away. The countervailing desire for a politically responsive official uh, under the new public management of the 1980s um, saw the introduction of uh, targets and key performance indicators. The Blair years saw the widespread introduction of political advisers who circumvented politically neutral processes of appointment and also circumvented channels of free and frank advice. The constitutional issues then are pervasive, but they're translated over time into different legal contexts which need to be understood in their terms. So that's about the ex ante controls. What about the controls after the fact? What about the legal accountabilities of public office? Um, well, these also underwent great change with the civil re service reforms that began in the 19th century. In the 18th century, office holders often employed their own servants, commonly took fees for service, um, as well as receiving a more nominal stipend. They took sureties from their servants in case of wrongdoing. They administered oaths. 
The fee-taking officer had duties to account to the exchequer, and there was a wealth of common law which distinguished between fees, bribes, and extortion. There's a book to be written about that or several. But in addition to the mandamus writ, which could force the appointment of officers, uh, could force officers to perform their duty, and the tort of misfeasance in public office, uh, they were subject to criminal informations for misfeasance and nonfeasance. By the end of the 18th century, there were few, quite a few new statutes began to create offences which could be brought against officers or their servants uh, in case they were overzealous in the performance of their duties. So you can inspect the linen, but don't do it with too much zeal or you're in trouble um, for some kind of criminal misdemeanour. On the other hand, even when the writ of certiorari was available, as it was in the case of the amphibious justices of the peace, who were both judges and administrators, the courts were only willing to supervise whether they were acting within jurisdiction and were complacent about bad or even irrational exercises of discretion. And looking at it in retrospect, this reflects the political relationship between the JP and the central government. The JP is a volunteer. His authority comes as much from his personal standing in the local community as from the official appointment. The quarter sessions um, are not only a court but a forum for political engagement with the centre as they've long been. The political relationship here was definitely not one of master and servant. So authority in office was personal and responsibility was personal during this time. Office had a distinct legal meaning and did not extend to just anyone who happened to work in the public service. Certain functions of office could not be delegated. Others requiring only common skill and diligence could be executed by way of deputy. The facts of a widely reported case brought in 1787 are illustrative, I think, of the kinds of practices at large and the attempts of the courts in Chancery to protect the notion of a propertied office holder exercising a free and independent will. Mr Garforth recommended the appointment of a Mr Ferron for an office in the Customs Department. Mr Garforth also appointed Mr Ferron's deputies and contracted that all the profits, salaries, wages and fees should be held in trust to be paid by Ferron to him. Lord Loughborough finds that the arrangement is unenforceable. Why? Because effectively it would make Mr Garforth the real authority, but, and I quote from the judgment here, not accountable for the due execution of the office, he may enjoy it without being subject to the public restraints imposed by the law on such officers. He may vote in elections. He may exercise inconsistent trades. He may act as magistrate in affairs concerning the revenue. He may sit in Parliament and will be safe if he remains undiscovered. If extortion be committed in the office by those appointed, the profits redound to him, but he escapes prosecution because his name doesn't appear on the Court of Exchequer's register and is not liable to the disabilities imposed by statute on officers guilty of extortion who are incapacitated to hold any office related to the revenue. So in this single passage, we get a sense of the numerous public law controls on an office holder as an office holder. It is he who has supervisory and legal responsibility. It is his conflicts of, law, of interest with which the law is primarily concerned. The problem at the heart of this arrangement is that Ferron is not in fact able to act as an independent person with a will of his own. So all of this changes in the 19th century, beginning with the democratic reforms to parliament, the 19th century experience, experiments in government, the use of general rules in legislation to delegate powers and decision making, and the establishment of a civil service. So all of these things come together in the 19th century and office as it had formerly been understood becomes rather a residual category now. From the 1850s, everyone, whether a minister or a civil servant, was to be regarded 
as a servant of the crown for liability purposes. You don't stand as yourself, you stand as the servant of the crown. And that, and I'm nearly finished, that brings me fittingly to Dicey. I'm a constitutional lawyer, I can't get away with talking about it without referring to Dicey. Um, and I think this story forces us to read Dicey in a new light. Dicey's famous formulation of the rule of law in 1885 um, says, and you'll all be familiar with this, with us, every official, from the Prime Minister down to a constable or a collector of taxes, is under the same responsibility for every act done without legal justification as any other citizen. The official has the same duties as an ordinary citizen, says Dicey. And Dicey uses the word official here and throughout his constitutional tre treaties uh, without any further explanation. But it's denuded of all the special public law controls that defined and constrained an official as an official in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Indeed, the central thrust of his invocation of the rule of law is that there should be no special law for officials. He ignores history. In his introduction, he says that he is not looking at the Constitution um, historically, but strictly in the lens of his own time. He doesn't want to criticise it or venerate it, but to understand it. He accuses other more historically minded constitutional lawyers, um, such as Freeman, of antiquarianism, and he doesn't mean it in a good way. Dicey is not interested in origins. He's not interested in abstract theory. It is not the role of the lawyer to know what the law of England was yesterday, still less centuries ago, or what it ought to be tomorrow, but to be able to, st I thought this would at least get some reaction in this <laughs> conference, um, thank you whoever that was, um, not the role of the lawyer to know what the law of England was yesterday, still less centuries ago, or what it ought to be tomorrow, but to be able to state what the principles of law which actually and in the present day exist in England. But what Dicey cannot fully comprehend in his time is that his statement about the present law would come to be viewed as a normative principle that officials should not be subject to special law. So Dicey's statement of the law as it is in 1885 inhibited the revival of a separate special administrative law until the 1960s, because he didn't know his history. He did, well, he might have known it, but he didn't. That was gone. We're in a new era. So is a historically respectable constitutional history and a history of the executive and administration in particular possible? I think it's possible. But it's multi-layered and it can't avoid theory in its various guises. Pervasive questions and concepts serve to anchor what counts as constitutional. Constitutional norms uh, will subsist, at least in the minds of constitutional lawyers. Even as the eagle-eyed historian can be allowed her aha moment to identify instances in which they've not been observed, of which there'll be many, and when great changes have been wrought by mere circumstance. It's the normative questions, though, which I think will endure. Maitland may have been correct when he said, that theory is more permanent than practice. Thank you.